One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to AmericanWarning2022.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, www.americanwarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 6th of September, 2022. Back after a one-week hiatus. I'd like to say it was a vacation, but uh, it was a bit of a sickness uh, that I caught down in Nicaragua. But back in the States, feeling great, ready to jump into this market. A lot has happened in the last couple of weeks, and we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about what's going on in Europe right now. There's a lot going on as far as energy and as far as defense stocks. Uh, we're seeing a depletion of weapons in Europe because they're giving a lot to Ukraine. We'll talk about that and some stock opportunities and also much, much more coming up right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is September 6, 2022. It's a beautiful Tuesday down here in South Florida. Just got back on Sunday evening after spending a month in Nicaragua. Unfortunately, about two weeks of it was spent in bed with uh, two different types of infections I caught down in a beautiful Latin American country. But the good news is on the men feeling much better. Uh, so that's why we took a week off last week. Uh, I would like to have said that it was from a great vacation of surfing and playing golf and pickleball, but now it was basically taking medication and sleeping about 18 hours a day. But we are back and ready to rock. Uh, and as, as I just mentioned, the markets have been kind of all over the place in the past uh, week and a half. Uh, markets are being driven by uh, the Fed meeting that will be coming up here later this month. And anticipation of the Fed being a little more aggressive than we thought maybe a couple of weeks ago, potentially going for a 75 basis point uh, rate hike. And uh, that could spook the markets a bit. The one bit of good news I do see here is that I believe a lot of this has been already priced into the market. And you've heard me say that before, and you probably say, Matt, you say that all the time. Uh, but the, the sell-off that we've seen in the market over the last couple of weeks and is, is continuing today uh, because you know a lot of it is just people are thinking, wow, maybe inflation is tougher to get under control than we thought. Maybe the Fed's going to be have to be even more aggressive than we thought. And pre-market this morning, uh, the stock futures were up nicely, up between a half percent and one percent. Now we have the Dow down a half percent and the Nasdaq down about one percent, along with the Russell 2000 small cap and mid cap stocks. So we're seeing the sell off continue right now. And uh, it's it's really there's, there's there's nowhere to hide. And and what I mean by that is if we take a look at what we call the 60 40 portfolio, I've talked about this in the past. It would be 60% into equities and the stocks and 40% into fixed income bonds. And for years, that has been a, a, a bit of a place to hide out, a safe haven, if you will. Well, that has not been the case as of late. Uh, this is actually the worst year on record for the 60-40 portfolios, going back to records from 1976. However, if you go back further, and people have done studies, and, and really through the month of August, uh, this portfolio is down 14%, the 60-40 portfolio, down 14% year to date through August. If we go back even further, and different people have done different numbers, some claim that going all the way back, believe it or not, to the Civil War, we have not had a, a worse start to a 60-40 portfolio going back that far. Obviously, you're pulling from different indices and different ways of, of valuing both equities and, and, and bonds going back that far, but it, it kind of gives you an idea. And the chart here shows you going back to 1976, the year I was born. 
and down 14%, as I mentioned, nothing even close to that, nothing even double digits in the last 46 years, nothing in double digits and only a couple years down. And of the years that have been down, there's only been seven down years through the month of August prior to this year in 46 years, almost all have been right around 5%, 6% or less. One was a little bit higher going back to 2002. Uh, but for the most part, you can see you're almost always up. And the reason for that is, is because typically if stocks pull back, bonds will do well. Money goes out of stocks and into bonds. But this has been a year where interest rates are going up, which means bond prices go down hand in hand with equity prices going down. So it's really been the perfect storm uh, for the downside uh, for when it comes to the 60-40 portfolio. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I want to show that because it, it's just showing really that there is nowhere to hide. And I want to show you another chart here really quick. And this is of um, the, the bond ETFs. I, I pulled a couple of bond ETFs and this is year to date. And I also put the S&P 500 in here. And this is as of uh, fr Friday's close heading into today. The S&P is down about 16.7% year to date. It's this little number down here. Uh, right, or uh, sorry, 16.8%. Uh, uh, right near there is the LQD, which is the corporate bond ETF investment grade, down about the same. Uh, but down 24.6% is the TLT. This is the, the iShares 20 plus year treasury bond ETF, basically investing in a long bond uh, for the US treasuries, down 24.6%. You have the JNK, which is a junk bond ETF, down 12.6%. Uh, doing a little bit better than that is a TIPS ETF, which is down about 8%. That's Treasury uh, Inflation Protected Securities, down about 8%, even with inflation going through the roof. And then down about 37 is the ProShares High Yield Interest Rate Hedged ETF, HYHG, which is supposed to be hedging against interest rates going up and still down 3.7%. So what I'm trying to show you here is there's really nowhere to hide, folks. There's really not much that has been doing well in, in the market right now. So the, the, if your portfolio is down, you are in the same class with probably 98 to 99% of investors out there right now, whether it be in bonds, whether you be an equity investor, again, nowhere really to hide right now. The one area that has been going up, and I don't know how many people have exposure to this directly, uh, is the U.S. dollar. Uh, the U.S. dollar index hit a 20-year high as the euro came down to a 20-year low. Uh, Euro came down to 99 cents versus the dollar, trading below parity. And that's where we're sitting right now. We're going to talk about Europe here in a moment. Uh, but again, let me show you a quick chart here of the U.S. dollar. And, and uh, you can see here, this is the U.S. dollar index. Uh, this is the DXY at 109.61, the best level that we've seen in 20 years. So there is an ETF that tracks this. The ETF is UUP as a symbol. So if you've been investing in that, obviously you've been doing well. That's one place that we've seen a hedge. Uh, but for the most part, as you can see here in this chart, uh, it's one of the few asset classes actually doing well. And it's really more about the fact that the U.S. dollar is the best looking home uh, in the ugliest block because most currencies are getting hit. Uh, but it's the best looking one, again, in the ugliest block that we have out there. Another area I look at before we jump into Europe and talk about some stocks um, is housing really quick. And, you know, more and more people are starting to talk about housing and, and what's going on in the housing market. We're starting to see prices come down in, how, in, in, in home prices. We're starting to see homes sell for below asking price for the first time in over a year. So we are seeing that, that kind of that rollover. I personally don't think that we have a crash when it comes uh, to the housing market. Uh, I think there's too much demand out there still, and I think there's not enough supply. But let me show you here four charts, and these have to do with what's going on in the housing market right now. The one up top here is a 30-year mortgage rate, up to 5.66%. As you can see, it was down around 2.8 or so, uh, less than two. That obviously years ago, so it's more than doubled. So it makes homes not as affordable. And with homes not as affordable, it means less people can afford homes and it means there's less buyers. So demand drops and prices will drop. And that's why we're seeing home prices come down. However, at the same time, the next chart you see down there is a Case-Shiller Home Price Index. It's for the national um, reading, still hanging on near an all-time high. So you can see home prices continue to go up, 
uh, even as uh, interest rates uh, are pushing mortgage rates higher. So now you can see here the next chart on, on downside is the U.S. Fixed Housing Affordability Index. Because mortgage rates are going higher, because home prices remain elevated, the affordability index at the lowest level we've seen in years. So that's, again, pushing people away from the ability to buy homes because affordability index is coming down. And then finally, in the bottom down here is the ITB. This is the iShares U.S. Home Construction ETF, a basket of home-related home stocks. It was above 80 uh, to uh, basically begin the year. We're down to 55, 60, well off the lows, uh, well off the low of 2020, which was down near 20. Uh, but again, a nice pullback we've seen here and probably see some continued weakness, to be honest with you, uh, when it comes to the uh, ITB and the home, home stocks. But I think there will be an opportunity at some point in the next probably 12 to 24 months. I just don't think that we're, we're there as of yet. But I want to give you a quick update because people keep asking about homes uh, and, and my view on home prices. And, and I again, it's regional. I've always said that. It's not a national thing. Uh, but I do think that we will see some continued pullback uh, when it comes to uh, home prices. And I think you're going to see people sitting back waiting uh, for that. So let's turn our attention here to Europe. And a, a few things going on uh, right now in Europe. Uh, one is that uh, Russia came out over the weekend and said that they're going to shut off the main gas supply to Europe indefinitely. And obviously, as we're getting closer to the winter months, that's a big freaking deal. And, and to me, that, that, that could mean very, very high rates uh, to basically heat your home uh, when it comes to uh, Western Europe. And that, that could cause some major problems, folks. And that, that could really uh, put a damper on the GDP of Europe and really hurt growth. And uh, this is a story I think that we have to continue to follow, a story we have to keep an eye on. And who knows where it goes? Russia, they're the bit of a wild card. Uh, <clears throat> they're saying this because of sanctions that uh, a lot of Western countries have put on it. You would think that this would be sending natural gas uh, higher here in the States, but it's not. Natural gas is actually down about 5%. So you're not seeing it, it, it correlate directly to that. And we see the oil and gas uh, energy related companies down as well. So you're not seeing a direct correlation yet, but it is something that we want to keep an eye on because uh, it really could have a major effect come winter time on the economies in Europe. So kind of related to that, uh, obviously, is what's going on in Ukraine uh, with what Russia continues to do uh, in Ukraine. And Ukraine, depending on you know, who you believe, uh, appears to be kind of holding their own. And, and that's that's really good news. Um, the reason they're able to do that is you're seeing a lot of European countries, uh, along with the U.S. as well, uh, give Ukraine money and give them um, uh, stock, stockpiles of weapons. So the EU came out a couple of days ago and said that their weapon stock are getting very depleted because they're passing their weapons on to Ukraine to be able to help them fight uh, Russia, keep them off. And that is a very interesting um, point I want to bring up because you're going to want to see Western Europe really um, restock those weapons. And they, they said they plan on it and they're going to. Because you never know, what if Russia is, the, the, decides to expand uh, their efforts to move past Ukraine and maybe into some Scandinavian countries? You're going to see NATO and some of these Western European countries really step up and uh, for, you know, f hope that doesn't happen. And that's not something I want to see. I don't want to see war. But they're, they're not stupid. They're going to be kind of uh, restockpiling uh, their, their weapons cache. And I think that's going to be very good for some of the stocks out there, some of the big name weapon suppliers. Whether you believe in that or not, again, you're not really backing war. You're just looking for investment opportunity. And I see this as an investment opportunity. So I'm going to show you here a couple of charts. I, I pulled up two ETFs that track aerospace and defense. The first is the iShares Euro, US Aerospace and Defense, symbols ITA, down a little over 2% year to date. And the other one is uh, the um, Invesco Aerospace Defense ETF, symbol PPA, down about 1.9%. So they're both down about 2%. They, they have a very similar pattern. And they're both up about 7% just a few weeks ago. But the sell-off we've seen in the market has brought down basically every sector, including aerospace and defense. Um, let's take a look at some of the individual stocks that are in there. And these are some of the top holdings. Uh, everything from Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop Grumman. Uh, Howmet Aerospace and Elbit Systems, 
Every single one is up year to date. Uh, you can see here Northrop's up about 24.5% heading into this week. Lockheed Martin up over 20%. Uh, Elbit Systems, uh, which is an Israeli company, makes drones and other things, up 19%. Uh, uh, Howmet Aerospace up 10%. And then Raytheon's lagging behind, but still up 3.5%, beating the overall market by about 20%. So you're seeing some really great outperformance uh, when it comes to the aerospace defense stocks. And uh, again, I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Uh, if you take a look at some of the holdings that we have here for um, ITA, it's very heavily concentrated on some of the big names. Raytheon makes up 21% of ITA, Lockheed Martin 16%, Boeing 7, uh, Northrop 5, and Howmed at 4.5%. Where if you look at PPA, it's a bit more uh, of a uh, diversified portfolio where its largest holding is Boeing at 7%, Northrop at 7 General Dynamics at 7 Lockheed Martin 6.5%, Raytheon at 6 So a lot of the overlap are the same, but it's a bit more diversified, which I like, because with ITA, you're putting about 37% of, of the investments into two stocks, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. That's over a third in, in just two stocks. I would like to be a little more diversified, and, and we will see the, the Raytheons, uh, the Lockheeds, the Northrops probably end up being the biggest winner because they have the ability to ramp up production pretty quickly. Uh, they obviously have a lot of great um, working relationships with a lot of these countries already. Uh, they have some of the most sophisticated um, and high-tech weapons out there that are being used right now. So it all really kind of makes sense uh, that you would want to look at some of the bigger names when it comes to aerospace defense. And again, it's, it's been a hedge this year. It's been on the few areas that's actually held up really well. Uh, and I don't see that ending anytime soon. I mean, let's all pray that the war in Ukraine ends today. Uh, I don't see it happening, but let's pray it does. But again, either way, folks, you're going to see uh, Western European countries. You're going to see uh, the U.S. start really ramping up, um, kind of restocking their, their piles of weapons. And something I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, and it, it kind of goes along with the same investment theme, um, is uh, Japan. You know, for years, uh, Japan has really not spent any money on, on aerospace defense, but they have changed the, a law that now allows them to do that. Um, so you're going to start seeing uh, some big spending out of Japan and uh, in aerospace defense. And again, that is just going to add to demand. And when demand outstrips supply, we see higher prices, we see companies doing well. And again, I, I, I really think that you're going to see companies such as Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, General Dynamics, Boeing, et cetera, all doing well uh, for the next 12 to 24 months as you see these countries really start to restock um, you know, their, def their defense systems. And you know, we're not getting into a world that's getting any safer, unfortunately. Um, so so I, I don't see... Uh, something happening here where, you know, kumbaya, you know, around the world. And again, I'd love to see that, but let's be realistic. So, you know, again, Western Europe, US, Japan, you know, in Japan in April of 2022, so just, you know, several months ago, they announced that they're going to seek to double Japan's defense budget. Um, so that's that's a big amount of money. Um, you know, because you look back and that the uh, traditionally they had what they call the one percent rule that has really constrained their, their defense spending for, for decades. Um, this goes back to w, uh, WW2, World War II. Uh, but now as that's changing again, they're going to start ramping up. And this doesn't have as much to really do with Ukraine and Russia, but has to do with uh, the South China Sea. What's going on in China and Taiwan? They want to make sure that they're they're all ready. You also have North Korea over in that area, that's, that's always a wild card. So you're going to see <clears throat> a lot of defense spending coming up in the near future. And, you know, let's take a look at a company like Raytheon, for example, about a $130 billion company. And um, they, they make money and, and they, they have big revenue. And because uh, you're selling products that have that have very high you know, price points. So Raytheon symbol RTX, you know, they had revenue uh, last year of $64.4 billion. This year, looking for 67. Next year, 73, up to about almost 80 billion in 2024. 
But what, what I really like about it is they made $4.27 a share last year, looking for nearly $6.50 in 2024. It's got a forward P ratio of 15.5, forward price sales 1.7. Um, it's got a, a nice peg ratio around one. Uh, Lockheed Martin, not much difference. Uh, Lockheed Martin symbol LMT. They trade with a forward P ratio of 15, forward price of sales 1.6. Uh, they had $27.48 a share last year, looking for about 29 in 2024, looking for revenue to go from 67, only 69 billion. So you're not seeing as much on, on the top line, but the bottom line continues to grow as margins increase which again is great for a large company such as Lockheed Martin. And again, Lockheed Martin up today with the market down. So you are definitely seeing uh, the money start to come into the sector again on this pullback. And I really like the pullback that we've seen in a lot of these stocks. ITA is up slightly today. That's the uh, shares U.S. Aerospace and Defense ETF. You know, that being up slightly today in the face of uh, the market pulling back and almost every sector being down uh, is really good news. So, um, you know, this is something you want to keep an eye on, folks. The combination, again, just to, to put it out there one more time, uh, Western Europe, the EU restocking their depleted piles of weapons. I think the U.S. will do the same. Japan already announced they're looking to double their defense budget as they change from uh, basically rules they've had in place since World War II. Uh, all this money coming in is going to be very good for these sectors. And again, it looks to be a really nice hedge against the market. And finally, they're not trading at really high multiples, which gives you an opportunity to get in. Uh, to some stocks that are trading at decent levels fundamentally uh, and not have to worry about big downside because, again, they're trading at nice uh, fundamental multiples right now. All right, folks, we're going to leave it there. Again, uh, the market is down uh, today. We had the S&P down about uh, S uh, Dow's down about 0.1%, uh, NASDAQ down about six tenths of a percent. So we're off the lows of the day. Who knows where we close? Uh, but again, uh, let's keep an eye on everything that's going on here. Uh, but right now, I expect more weakness, more volatility in the next couple of weeks. Get ready. Uh, hold on. Uh, but let's look for some opportunities such as what we just came up with in aerospace and defense. So, again, folks, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be back after taking a week off. Uh, and we'll be back Thursday with a great interview with one of the founders of Wall Street Bets talking meme stocks. Something you don't want to miss coming up on Thursday. But again, thanks so much for watching. This is Making Money. And I'm Matt McCall. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.